How is everyone doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I am your host, Dr. Joe Berkowitz. Uh, today, again, once again this week, we are back in the library. I am doing uh, the fourth episode of The Lords of Easy Money. Today, we're going to be covering chapter three from the book. And uh, before we get started here, I'm going to bring in my trusty PowerPoint slide here so we can do a quick review of what happened in chapter two. So in chapter two, we took a, a kind of a deep dive into Tom, Tom Honig's uh, childhood and his early career, his experience as a bank examiner, and we really got into his whole background. Then we got into basically a, a very kind of uh, what I would call a cursory overview of the history of central banking in America. And then we kind of wrapped it up with an examination of some of the Fed's actions in the 1970s and basically how ultimately what we're going to see is how those mistakes in the 70s are repeating themselves again in today's current environment. So and and, and there's going to be more on that today in, in chapter three. So. So chapter three, this is called the Great Inflation or Inflations, and we're going to be covering the years from 1980 to 1991 today. So we're going to kick this off with basically inflation of the 1970s uh, sets up bank failures that, you know, starting in basically the 1980s. So let's get in here and it says, um, OK, so. The forces that combusted in 1980 had been building for many years. Uh, bankers are making these loans in an environment where asset values are strong and rising, Haunting explained. This put the Fed examiners in a bind. They believed that bank loans were risky because the asset prices underpinning those loans were probably overvalued. But the bankers argued back, pointing out that the asset prices were marked according to fair market value. The value of assets isn't a fixed or even a knowable thing. It's a matter of judgment. Examiners are no more able to predict the future than the bankers are, Honig said. So right now we're kind of setting the stage where we, we've come off this inflationary period in the 1970s. And now we're in 1980, uh, you know, we're you know having the election, you know, Reagan's getting elected. And you've got Paul Volcker, who just came in at the Fed in 1979, who we're going to get to in a minute. But uh, but now you've got this situation in 1980 where loans are starting to turn. Loans are starting to go bad. And we're going to see, you know, basically where this is where this is going. So. Um, and it basically says, you know, this whole experience and a massive financial ruin that followed. Um, in its wake, provided Tom with the most important education of his career. It taught him in very fine detail about the powerful and unruly thing that economics, what, ec what economists call an asset bubble. Decades later, the great inflation was not usually described in terms of asset bubbles. So when people look back on the 1970s, they tend to talk only about half of the disaster, which was the shocking inflation of consumer prices for things like meat and gasoline. But the great inflation was so destructive because it was actually two kinds of inflation that were intertwined and each one fed off the other. The other one was the inflation of asset prices, um, a phenomenon that later became the most important feature of American economic life. Asset inflation was the force behind the dot-com crash of 2000, the housing market crash of 2008, and the unprecedented market crash of 2020, which was precipitated by the coronavirus outbreak. So again, you're, we're talking about something that's, that's called an asset bubble. It's, it's, and, and the amazing thing is that there are asset bubbles all around us today. There, there's literally, there, there probably isn't an asset class that has not been inflated into bubble status, whether it's credit card debt or auto loans or residential mortgages or commercial real estate or student loans. I mean, you have your pick. Uh, they all have been basically transformed into these bubble assets that we will that we will basically see. Um, but the the key thing here is you're talking about an asset bubble, but you're also talking about um, you know, you're also talking about asset prices. Uh, the you know, you know, people talk about price inflation. They don't talk about asset inflation, and that's basically the key thing to understand. Again, when you go back to the 1970s, you 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 always hear that conversation. People always talk about oh, the prices and gas and and the food prices and everything going through the roof, whatever. But they don't talk about how asset prices were inflated, which is the other half of that coin. 
So now we continue. So a bar of gold, on the other hand, is an asset. A share of stock is an asset. A painting is an asset. An apartment building is an asset. The Federal Reserve can stoke asset inflation when it keeps money too cheap for too long, pushing asset prices so high that they are no longer supported by the actual value of the asset. This is when asset prices become a bubble. Uh, one of the best examples of an asset bubble was described in 1955 by the economic historian John Kenneth Galbraith in the Department of Some in the Department of Some Things That Never Change. Um, Galbraith described an asset bubble in Florida real estate in the early 1900s. Developers were expecting a lot of people to move to the state, so they bought big tracts of land and subdivided it into neighborhood plots. Then. They sold deeds of ownership for the plots. In this case, the actual land in Florida was an asset and the deeds to the land were an asset. Because the paper deeds could be bought and sold, speculation in Florida real estate took off. The price of land and the price of deeds for the land spiraled upward. The asset inflation was stoked by the very fact that asset prices were rising in the first place. One person bought a deed and sold it for more money and this enticed yet a third person to buy the deed because its price was going up. If this cycle could go on forever, the world would be a much happier place. But inevitably, the price of an asset converges with the actual value of the asset. So in Florida, this convergence happened when it became clear that the expected hordes of people were not moving there. Hurricanes kept hitting the state, dissuading new homeowners, and a lot of the overhyped subdivisions were located on hot, humid stretches of swamp without a beach in sight. So people started selling, then everyone started selling, the bubble burst and the asset price collapsed. And thus, that's a very good example of an asset bubble. Um, so let's hold on. Let's follow through with the PowerPoint here for a second. So let's get in here. So, okay, so we got asset bubble, the John Kenneth Galbraith example here. And now asset bubbles in farming, uh, oil and natural gas and commercial real estate. So, so Tom watched and in the 1970s, as asset bubbles flared across the Kansas City Fed's district, which included both heavy farming states like Kansas and Nebraska and the energy producing state of Oklahoma, the self-reinforcing logic of asset bubbles was painfully evident in farming. When the FOMC kept interest rates low, it encouraged farmers to take on more cheap debt and buy more land. This in turn stoked demand for farmland, which pushed up land prices. The higher land prices encouraged more people to borrow and yet and buy yet more land. The banker's logic followed a similar path. The bankers saw farmland as collateral on the loans, and they believed the collateral would only rise in value. More lending led to more buying, which led to higher prices, which led to more lending. The same thing has happened in the oil and natural gas business. Rising oil prices and cheap debt encouraged oil companies to borrow money and drill more wells. The banks built a whole side business dedicated to risky energy loans. In commercial real estate, it was the same thing. This is how asset bubbles escalate in a loop that intensifies with each rotation, with the reality of today's higher asset prices driving the value of tomorrow's asset prices ever higher, increasing the momentum even further. So you can see how it's it just this thing rolls. Um, you know, more lending led to more buying, which led to higher prices, which led to more lending. And this, this is how the asset bubbles get stoked. Um, so now we go on. So while, uh, while Tom and his team were arguing with the bankers, the FOMC was stoking the great inflation even more by keeping interest rates low. Now, here's where it becomes really interesting, but this stopped in 1979 and it was stopped with a severity that has never been repeated. And it was stopped because of one person, Paul Volcker, who became chairman of the Federal Reserve. So now we end, now enter Paul Volcker and his fight on inflation. So Volcker was serious about beating inflation. He was willing to push the unemployment rate to 10% to do so, to force homeowners to take out mortgages carried seven, carrying 17% interest rates or higher and to make consumer loans so expensive that many Americans couldn't afford to buy cars. Volcker recognized that when he was fighting inflation, he was actually fighting two kinds. There was asset inflation and price inflation. He called them cousins and acknowledged that they had been created by the Fed. The real danger comes from the Fed encouraging or inadvertently tolerating rising inflation and its close cousin, the extreme speculation and risk-taking. In effect, 
standing by while bubbles and accesses threaten financial markets, Volcker wrote in his memoir. Geez, where have I seen that before? Oh, that's right. That's exactly what the Fed's been doing for the last couple of years. Hmm. All right. So again, keep keep note of this stuff as we're as we're going. So Volcker's predecessors had encouraged these risks, but Volcker would not. Under his leadership, the Fed raised short-term interest rates from 10% in 1979 to 20% in 1981, the highest they have ever been. When the history of interest rates is plotted on a graph, this period of super high rates looks like a mountain peak. This is why Volcker's tenure as Fed chairman is such an important period in the history of U.S. monetary policy. He is remembered as one of the few people willing to initiate the brutal shock therapy necessary to correct years of mistakes. Volcker's high uh, Volcker's rate hikes devastated the economy, put millions of people out of work and ended the great inflation. And yes, un unfortunately, my uh, my father's business was one of those casualties uh, back in those days. In, in 1981, 82, uh, the, the recession that came in there absolutely crushed his business. Um, but that's another story for another time. But uh, but I, I lived through this as a child, so I, I can I can appreciate and understand this a lot more now looking back on it. Um, so at first, people didn't think Volcker was serious about raising rates. Then they didn't think he'd actually be able to do it. It seemed inconceivable that the Federal Reserve would go through with a plan that would push the economy into recession. Uh, but that weekend, short-term rates were 11.6%. By the end of the month, they would be 16%. In less than a year, they reached the high of 20%. So, and it's it's just kind of interesting to note, at first, people, and I think I, I interpret people here as the media, uh, the media didn't think that Volcker was serious about raising rates. We literally saw that in 2022 when the Fed came out and said, oh, we're going to increase rates. And all the people on CNBC were like, no, 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 they can't increase rates. They can't, they won't increase rates. They won't do that. That would be crazy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then what happened? They did the, they did the rate increases. And now people are saying, oh, they're going to cut the rates. They're going to cut the rates. They're going to cut the rates. And now the, the Fed's sitting there going, yeah, we're, we're not really sure how we're going to cut the rates, whatever. But anyway, it's just something to note, just something kind of interesting to note. So the reporters, here we go, the reporters pressed Volcker that Saturday night asking if rate hikes would damage the economy. He was largely dismissive of the question. I would be optimistic in the results of these actions, he said. I think the best indications that I have now in an uncertain world is that it can be accomplished reasonably smoothly. So what are we hearing right now today from the Fed? Oh, we're going to have this soft landing. We're going to have this soft landing and everything's going to be fine. It's going to be cool. We're just going to cruise right on through. No problems. So again, uh, the, the lesson here is that history repeats itself. Like everything you're seeing today literally happened back in the 70s and the early 80s. So now we get into the jarring effects on banks and, and Tom's uh, kind of experience with the Kansas City Fed. So the change was, uh, oh, it's, I should take a step back for a second. So Volcker was wrong on this point. Uh, nothing went reasonably smoothly. The American economic ecosystem had settled itself around the North Star of low interest rates. Volcker moved the pole star overnight and everything reoriented. A decade's worth of resource allocation would change and everything would shift back in from the edge of the yield curve away from risk. So he completely turned the market on its head and he did it almost overnight. And in effect, we're, we're kind of seeing a similar kind of thing right now, but not to the degree with which Volcker did it. Um, and so basically this change was wrenching. It played out very quickly in the Kansas City Federal Reserve District. The bankers were caught totally off guard. And it, 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 <laughs> did we not see that last year? Do we not see that with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank? Oh, you know, what was part of their problem? Part of their problem was that they had gone out long on bonds when they should have been short or should have been in a cash position. They, they you know, they were like, oh, the Fed's not going to increase interest rates. And so they went long on the yield curve and it came back and it killed them. It killed their bond portfolios. And, and that was part of the, it's not the sole reason, but it was part of the reason what happened there. But again, you see this, this, this thing where like, oh, the bankers were caught completely off guard. You know, uh, you could see that no one anticipated that adjustment, even after Volcker began to address inflation. They didn't think it would happen to them. When Paul Volcker and the Fed doubled the cost of borrowing, the demand for loans slowed down, which in turn depressed the demand for assets like farmland 
and oil wells. The price of assets began to converge with the underlying value of the assets. So what are we in the early stages of seeing right now? Loan demand is dramatically slowing. We haven't seen quite the 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 drop in asset prices yet but we're but we're getting there we're starting to see it obviously commercial real estate commercial office buildings we're seeing it there but we're you know so we're 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 but we're moving in this direction um the price of farmland fell by 27 percent in the early 1980s of of oil from more than 120 to 25 dollars by 1986 the collapse of asset prices created a cascading effect within the banking system assets like farmland and oil reserves had been used to underpin the value of bank loans and those loans were themselves considered assets on the bank's balance sheet when land and oil prices fell the entire system fell apart Banks wrote down the value of their collateral and the reserves they were holding against default. At the very same moment, the farmers and oil drillers started having a hard time meeting their monthly payments. The value of crops and oil were falling, so they earned less money each month. The bank's balance sheets, which once looked stable, began to corrode and falter. Hawnig's examiners had the unpleasant job of pointing out the obvious. The financial health of the banks was collapsing along with asset prices. Predictably, the banks fought back. The bankers almost always asked for more time. They promised that if they were given a chance, a few more months or a few more quarters, they could turn things around. Asset prices would rise. The balance sheets would improve. So, And we're going to get into the Fed's record in a minute here. So again, the the, the you, you see this same thing play out in these cycles. You know, the banks are just like, oh, hey, we just need more time. We just need more time. We just need more time. Give us a chance. You know, we'll figure, we'll make it work. We'll figure it out. Um, to be fair, sometimes that is accurate. That's not necessarily a totally inaccurate thing. With time, you can work yourself out of these things. However, it's a big however. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's it's sometimes it can also just be wishful thinking. I mean, sometimes the situation is so bad, you're just you're not going to turn that thing around in in a, in a month or in a quarter or two quarters or maybe even three years. I mean, it's just it's just not going to it's just not going to happen. So um, so Tom's team spent most of the early 1980s doing one thing, deciding which banks could actually survive if given more time and which banks were doomed. The Fed was the lender of last resort, and its power in this role was almost limitless. It could print money, so it could lend as much money as it chose to, but Congress had imposed one limit on this power. The Fed wasn't supposed to lend to banks that were going to fail. The emergency loans were doled out through the Fed, Fed so, uh, Fed's so-called discount window, and Tom oversaw the Kansas City Fed's discount window in the 1980s. When his team decided who could borrow from the discount window, they were rendering life or death judgments on banks. Um, and a true panic broke out in 1982, the worst since the Great Depression. More than 100 banks failed that year, far more than in any single year since the 1930s. Um, in 1986, the rate was higher with more than 200 banks failing. Overall, more than 1,600 banks failed between 1980 and 1994. That was a, that was a rough uh, that 14, 15 years was a, was a rough period of time. There were some, there was some good in there, but there was also, yeah, a lot of bad. I mean, two kind of really big recessions there in the early eighties and the early not kind of like 89 to 91, 92. Um, yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't good. So, um, and basically, uh, Tom developed a broad rule of thumb to evaluate these banks. He noticed that the best plans had a lot of detail. The worst plans were vague and peppered heavily with platitudes. Bankers, Tom came to believe, were like anyone else. Some of them were honest and hardworking. A small minority were hucksters. But it wasn't just the hucksters who were failing. Many of the failed banks had been in business for generations. They were the financial pillars of small communities throughout the region. And so um, there was a point there that I wanted to make that I kind of... Uh, that I was wanted to go back to. I'm trying to think. Uh, I've kind of lost my thought on that. Um, oh, so when it said that Congress had imposed one limit on the Fed's power, that the Fed was not supposed to lend to banks that were going to fail, there is a huge reason for that, and it's called the moral hazard. So in other words, the moral hazard goes like this. If you bail one person out, then you have to bail everyone out. 
and you cannot afford to bail everyone out because you just you can't do it. So it becomes it becomes a moral hazard. Like, in other words, you can't set the precedent when you start. And then when you start bailing people out, if you don't start bailing everyone out now, you are doing what you're picking winners and losers. You're showing favoritism. You're showing bias. Um, and that is is an, 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 an environment, an economy that's supposed to be a free market where you know where you know people have the opportunity to make all the success in the world well they also have the ability to fail too it's not you know uh capitalism is not supposed to be a, a safety net for everyone so to speak um so you know so again you had this thing known as a moral hazard and it's and, and you know the fed has broken that moral hazard for pretty much the last 15 years and they and we'll and we're going to see here in a minute like kind of kind of what happened here with this um so what happened, uh, you know, so basically what happened here with with Tom's uh, kind of experience here as we continue through this. So so Tom was cursed at, shouted at and informed in the clearest way possible that his decision had ruinous consequences. They could become quite stressed and quite vocal in their objections. Tom said of the bankers, you could empathize with them enormously. You could understand the anguish. Lives were destroyed in this environment. People lost everything in this environment. I didn't blame them for yelling or being distraught. It would have been easy enough for Tom to blame the bankers when the bubble burst. Examples of banking grotesquerie were abundant. Uh, this is what happens in a speculative bubble. Stupidity and risk-taking thrive during the upswing, then cause misery on the downswing. Downswing. But uh, but Tom didn't think the stupidity in lending was entirely the banker's fault. Uh, they were, after all, responding to macroeconomic conditions like rising inflation, relatively low interest rates when compared to inflation and rising asset prices. So it wasn't the bankers who created these conditions. And it was Honig's own institution, the Federal Reserve. The fact is bankers make the loans. They made them in an environment of incredible optimism in terms of asset values. And that really was in part the fault of a decade of too accommodative monetary policy. This was the dynamic that so often gets lost in the discussion about the inflation of the 1970s and the collapse and recession of the 1980s. The Fed got credit for ending inflation and for bailing out the, the solvent banks that survived it. But new research published many decades later showed that the Fed was also responsible for the whole disaster. Let me say that again. The Fed got credit for ending inflation and for bailing out the solvent banks that survived it. But the new research from today shows decades later that the Fed was also responsible for the entire disaster. So in other words, this whole thing could have been prevented if the Fed had not made the actions that it did. So now... Let's take a look at the Fed's record during the 70s. We're going to take a re-examination of this record here. So perhaps the, the most detailed account of how the Federal Reserve handled the great inflation is related to a book called The History of the Federal Reserve. Um, this book, the author is an economist named Alan Meltzer. Um, he reconstructed the Fed's decision making during the 1970s using transcripts of FOMC meetings combined with other public documents and detailed economic studies and data. His verdict on the inflation in the 1970s was stark. It was monetary policy set by the Fed that primarily created the problem. The great inflation resulted from policy choices that placed much more weight on maintaining high or full employment than on preventing or reducing inflation, he wrote. For much of the period, this choice reflected both political pressures and popular opinion as expressed in polls. So this statement was considered combative and inflammatory as far as Fed uh, economic histories go. What Meltzer was saying was that the Fed basically didn't know what it was doing during the 1970s. Maybe even more damning, he was arguing that the Fed was not the independent agency it claimed to be. The members of the FOMC were not wise technocrats making decisions about the money supply guided by nothing more than high-minded economic theory. They were humans, driven at least in part by political pressures. Meltzer said the Fed kept struggling to boost job creation by printing more money, not because the economic equations dictated it, but because that's what the public and the politicians wanted the Fed to do. The FOMC believed the unemployment rate should have been close to 4%, but it never fell below 6%. 
between 1975 and 1977 and was still near 6% in 1978. So the Fed kept printing money and in doing so, it stoked the asset inflation bubbles that created ruinous high unemployment rates above 10% in the early 1980s. So let's take a second here and let's re-look at that. The FOMC believed the unemployment rate should have been close to 4%, but it never fell below 6 between 1975 and 1977. Furthermore, it was still near 6% in 1978. So what did they do? They kept printing money and doing it so it stoked the asset and inflation bubbles that ultimately created ruinously high unemployment rates above 10%. So what is the Fed doing right now? They What have they been doing for the last four years? They've been basically printing money, pumping more and more money into the economy and it's the same exact thing that they did in the 1970s. And they're and and basically they're looking at it and they're saying, oh, well, the unemployment rate is so low. So therefore it's safe for us to we'll just keep printing money. And they're setting the stage for exactly the same thing that happened. They're setting the stage for a ruinously high unemployment rate that is going to come. And if you if you look at the episode that I just did on the January jobs report, you'll understand that I think we're basically already there. I think we're I think we're already there. I think the I think the labor um, market is in big, big, big trouble. And those numbers, the real numbers are going to start to come to the surface here in the next six, seven, eight months. Um, OK, so let's continue on here. So. So now what was the cause of all this and looking back so the fed's take is that basically you had honest mistakes and monetary monetary policy neglect and we're going to talk about something very important here a concept called cost push versus demand pull so um so part of the mistake here on the Fed was due to honest mistakes. The Fed was making decisions based on data that was eventually proven to be wrong. This was only uncovered years later after the data was revised. One key piece of mistaken data was consistently low estimations of price inflation. But the problem was more fundamental than mistaken data. There is strong evidence that the Fed during the 1970s didn't even truly understand how monetary policy was affecting the economy and stoking inflation. In a 2004 report, the Fed economist Edward Nelson wrote that the most likely cause of inflation during the 70s was something he called monetary policy neglect. Basically, the Fed kept its foot on the money pedal through most of the decade because it didn't understand that more money was creating more inflation. This wasn't done out of malice, but out of misunderstanding. The Fed, along with many prominent economists of the era, believed that the country was experiencing something called cost push inflation. So let me ask you this for a second. Um, if we know this, I have this book. You're listening to me, you know, talk about this book here in front of you. Uh, so in the Fed, obviously, they they were there. You know, they have people there that that live this thing and, and went through it. So why is it that we are, you know, why is it that, that you know, I could sit here and, and have this and understand what's going on, but the Fed can't seem to understand this and, and are making the exact same mistake all over again. But anyway, it's just something to ponder. So. But anyway, so the cost push inflation. So this theory holds that a bunch of external forces that had nothing to do with the Fed were pushing up costs. So in other words, like big labor unions, for example, were pushing up the cost of labor and Middle Eastern cartels were driving up the cost of oil. It was these costs that pushed inflation higher and higher, not the Fed. Decades later, a very different understanding of inflation took hold at the Fed. This was the demand pull theory which located the blame for inf inflation squarely inside the Fed's boardroom. By increasing the money supply, the Fed stoked demand for debt and loans, which pulled inflation higher. Cheaper money meant more loans, more borrowing, and more demand for everything, which further pulled up prices. This idea is commonly described as the phenomenon of too many dollars chasing too few goods, meaning that when you print more money, people use that money to buy things and it drives up prices. The same forces uh, you know, drives up consumer prices and asset prices alike. So it's the same thing causing price inflation and asset inflation. And we have, and, and right now, what do we have? We have the same thing. We have too many dollars chasing too 
few goods. We have demand pull. So in the 1970s, the Fed left the job of fighting inflation to others. Every time unemployment rose or economic growth slowed down, the Fed cut rates and printed more money. And this pointed to the deepest problem of all, at least in Meltzer's account of the fiasco, the fiasco. The Fed was reacting to short-term pressures, and in doing so, it was pumping out new money that created long-term risks. The members of the FOMC were reading the news like everyone else, and they didn't want to be accused of making things worse during a decade of race riots, recessions, and protests. So whatever the FOMC tried to raise interest rates, which would have cooled inflation, the committee quickly retreated because unemployment rose or growth weakened. Although many FOMC members understood that reducing inflation required consistent long-term action, there is scant evidence of long-term planning, Meltzer wrote. So that leads to a very interesting thing. So in other words, what the Fed is, what he's saying here is the Fed is looking at this and going, we know what we're supposed to be doing, but we're not going to do it because basically there, there's all kinds of other turmoil and things going on in the economy. And, you know, you know, the unemployment goes up and then, you know, growth gets weakened and there's already all this other stuff going on. And basically politicians and people are saying, no, 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 we got enough problems. Don't don't add to basically our, our bucket issues. And, and, and there's they're they're sitting here saying that, oh, well, the Fed went, well, oh, OK, we understand that. So so we're OK, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to we're just going to leave it as it as even though they understood the long term implications of this. So, um. So now we're going to get into uh, Tom's hard-earned lesson. So, uh, so Honig had seen firsthand how an FOMC decision made in a day in a single vote took months or even years to express itself fully in the world as the effects filtered out through the banking system and economy. Monetary policy operates with what they refer to as long and variable lags. So he said this repeatedly, sometimes in a way that looked like he wanted to pound the table to get his point across. His frustration stemmed from the fact that this piece of hard-earned knowledge seemed to be ignored at every turn. When there was short-term trouble, like a drop in the market or a jump in unemployment, the Fed intervened. It printed more money and cut interest rates. It addressed short-term problems and left the long-term problems to grow. So during the 1980s, Honig and his colleagues in Kansas City were left to sort out the long-term problems the Fed's short-term thinking created during the 1970s. The biggest mess, however, they cleaned up was the failure of Penn Square, a bank in Oklahoma that had extended a chain of risky energy loans during the 1970s. When Penn Square failed, it almost took down the entire U.S. banking system with it. It also illuminated a second important pattern that would harden in the coming years. The Fed didn't just stroke asset bubbles. It found itself on the hook to bail out the very lenders who profited from profited the most off a bubble as it rose. So some banks the Fed was about to discover had grown too large and too interconnected to fail. So. Now we're going to get in real quickly into the Penn Square failure. So Penn Square was an early pioneer of what's called securitization, whereby the bankers created risky debt and then sell it to someone else. Penn Square's version of securitization was the sale of a participating loan. Jennings would loan money to an oil company and then sell most of the loan to another bank while keeping a small share of the debt on its own books. The idea was simple, extend as many loans as possible, collecting fees with each deal and move the actual risk of a loan default to someone else's balance sheet. This helped Penn Square avoid rules requiring it to keep a certain amount of cash reserves on hand. Penn Square also gamed rules that limited how much money it could loan to any one person by using comp complex webs of interlocking shell companies and partnerships. There was a loan limit of $35 million per person, for example, but Penn Square still managed to loan $115 million to an oil executive named Robert Hefner. Going through all the schemes would fill a book, and it did. They, the gentleman did wrote a book about that. Um, but the result was simple. Between 1974 and 1981, Penn Square's assets jumped from $35 million to $525 million in eight years. That is, an, that is an, uh, a pretty incredible jump in eight years, uh, especially back then. So, so the FDIC was the grim executioner that arrived when the Fed's discount window was no longer an option. The agency liquidated insolvent banks 
using taxpayer money to repay retail customers who had accounts at the bank with 100,000 or less in deposits. Now that was obviously changed in the last few years up to 250,000, but um, the FDIC and the KC Fed went back and forth about Penn Square. The Fed provided millions of dollars in emergency loans, but Tom and the Fed lawyer, uh, this gentleman named John York, uh, were growing skeptical that the bank could survive. Letting Penn Square fail would wipe out millions of dollars in equity, but letting the bank stay alive and continuing to borrow from the Fed and others could make things worse. That could be a real mistake because that can lead to larger losses, York said. So at an emergency meeting in Washington that Sunday, Paul Volcker, Paul, Paul Volcker cast his own vote on the matter. Penn Square should be allowed to fail. On Monday, the verdict was rendered final through a series of letters between the FDIC, the Fed, and the Treasury Department's um, OCC. The FDIC pronounced Penn Square insolvent. The Kansas City Fed declared Penn Square was ineligible for more emergency loans. So Tom had the duty of breaking the news to Penn Square. The banker's response fit the pattern that Tom had grown accustomed to. They would say, it's your fault that we're failing. If you gave us more time, we could work this out, he recalled. But the really important thing about the failure of Penn Square is that the damage was not contained. The failure was just the first shock in a large cascade of shocks. There were still all those participating loans to contend with. It was only when the loans started failing that it became clear just how broadly they had infected the banking system. The loan failures revealed that a very large bank in Chicago called Continental Illinois National Bank and Trust Company was one of the biggest customers for Penn Square's assembly line of risky debt. Continental Illinois had purchased $1 billion worth of these loans in just a few short years towards the end of the 1970s. This caught everyone by surprise. Continental was seen as a conservative, even boring bank. It lent money to auto companies and steelmakers in the Midwest. But the forces unleashed during the Great Inflation were too much for it. Continental Illinois pushed out um, along the old curve straight to Oklahoma. Continental had become the biggest commercial and industrial lender in the country. In 1984, it had $40 billion in assets. Things fell apart quickly when the oil loans went bad. So now, so, and Continental was going to fail. So here we see that you see the infection in the system with the participating loans. And now we have the Continental Bank failure and, and subsequent bailout. And, and we're going to see where this goes here in, in a second. Now, I want everybody to keep in mind, remember back to 07 and 08 with Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. And what did we see there? Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail. And then the contagion of that failure caught everyone by surprise. And then what happened? Bear Stearns failed and they had to come in and bail, bail Stearns, Bear Stearns out because they were freaked out by what had happened. And so, so this is, so literally it's, it was the same thing that happened almost 30 years prior and, but only Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, obviously on a much incredibly, insanely larger scale than what happened here, but it was the same thing that happened. And so you see these things just, they repeat themselves again and again. So let's get in here to the, the thing. Let's see what happened with Continental real quick. So even Paul Volcker became nervous when he was faced with the failure of Continental Bank. He communicated constantly with the FDIC as the bank teetered. He was warned that Continental's collapse could not be contained. The bank was simply too large and too deeply connected with too many other banks. Um, the FDIC estimated that 2,300 banks had money invested in Continental. About 179 banks had so much money in Continental that it amounted to more than half of their equity. Its failure might drag them down with it. Even more worrisome, about half of those banks were insured by the FDIC in case of failure. This would put unprecedented strain on the FDIC, which was already handling about 80 bank failures at that moment. The FDIC and the Fed came up with an alternative. The FDIC provided an extraordinary rescue package, injecting $1.5 billion into Continental. But most important, the FDIC promised to cover bank losses above a previously set threshold of $100,000, protecting all bondholders and depositors. This was a huge increase in the safety net for banks that invested money in Continental while knowing that the FDIC would only insure part of it. Now, all of it was insured by taxpayers. Simultaneously, the Fed promised that it would give Continental emergency loans until the crisis passed. So the Continental bailout was one of the most important legacies of the great inflation. If a bank got big enough and spread enough risk to other banks, then that bank 
would be rescued in a crisis. The previously existing rules would be bent or rewritten to save the bank. This precedent brought a new term into the vocabulary of American banking. During a congressional hearing about the Continental bailout, a Republican congressman from Connecticut named Stuart McKinney described the situation in a, in a pithy statement. Mr. Chairman, let us not bandy words. We have a new kind of bank. It's called too big to fail. So if you ever wonder where that phrase came from, there you go. So too big to fail was, was coined in the bailout of Continental Bank back in the 1980s. So now let's wrap this up here. So Volcker's end and Honig's future, and then a neighborly reminder. So Paul Volcker's career as chairman did not end pleasantly. He had whipped inflation and was then driven back to the wilderness FOMC members cast dissenting votes against Volcker more often than at almost any chair and more, more often than at almost any chairman in modern Fed history. He asked not to be reappointed after his term ended in 1987. Volcker's halo would only be bestowed in later years when economic historians decided that his efforts against inflation had been independent minded and uniquely effective, but he was never again at the center of American power. So, there's a very important lesson to be learned there from Paul Volcker, and that is he was incredibly courageous in what he did. And they said it right here. He was independent minded and uniquely effective. He he stood in the breach and he did something. And you, 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 you cannot forget that in that moment, you know, he was he was berated by a lot of people. I mean, the media beat him up constantly. Look what you're doing to the economy. And 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 we paid a big price for that. I mean, that recession in 1981-82 was a brutal, brutal recession. But but what he did worked and it set the stage for an incredible growth that happened thereafter and the, throughout throughout most of the rest of the, the 1980s. Um, you know, but but his but his price for that was that basically people, you know, the, the, the people in the Fed, it's very interesting. He did the right thing and ultimately it worked, but he was he was basically treated like a leper at the Federal Reserve. I mean, he was dissented upon, not because he was wrong, just because they basically hated the guy. They hated the guy for doing what they didn't have the guts to do and doing what was right. And they hated him for it and basically cast him out and kicked him to the curb and said, all right, man, you're, you're out of here. You're done. You know, thanks a lot great job, but you're out, you're out, you're done. So it, it's just, it, again, it's, it's important to, to look at these things and kind of understand the context of what happened here with some of these people. So, um, so the wave of bank closures eventually receded in Kansas city feds district. The Penn square failure was the worst of it. Um, Honig's personal performance during the crisis was noted by the people around him, like York, who believed Tom had handled himself during a brutal period with integrity and competence. This reputation proved important when the Kansas City Fed president, Roger Guffey, announced he was retiring in 1991. The Kansas City Fed had never hired a president from its own ranks, but um, Tom put his name forward anyway. There were about 150 applicants for the job. Guffey would choose his replacement with the help of the Kansas City Fed's board of directors. The Fed's chairman and board of governors in Washington would also need to approve the hire. Finally, uh, so after a couple of interviews and stuff, so Tom was ushered into the office of the new Fed chairman, Alan Greenspan, um, a soft spoken economist with many decades of political experience in Washington. Greenspan had worked on Wall Street and in the White House under Presidents Nixon and Ford. Greenspan became chairman shortly before the stock market crash in 1987, and he won nearly universal praise for his deft handling of the crisis. He developed a reputation for maneuvering the Fed's levers of power gracefully like a surgeon. Greenspan was inscrutable behind his large owlish eyeglasses. During the job interview with Tom Honig, Greenspan listened more than he talked. He listened more than he talked. I was someone who was aware of the effects of easy policy for too long, Tom recalled. I thought policy should be done very carefully with an eye towards inflation. More than that, Tom believed that monetary policy needed to be made with restraint with a long-term view. Every action you take has long-run consequences, he said. Greenspan was silent on this matter, as Tom remembered it, but the chairman apparently approved. Tom got the job. So after news got out that Tom was president, one of his elderly neighbors approached him with a gift. It was a framed copy of a piece of German currency, a single bill with a face value of 500,000 marks. 
Below the bill was a simple inscription that read, in 1921, this note would buy a large house. In 1923, this note would buy a loaf of bread. So it was a living memento of Germany's era of hyperinflation. Tom hung it in his office downtown. It was a good reminder of the destructive power of inflation, or at least the first kind of inflation, meaning price inflation, which can make a currency almost worthless. But Tom was worried about the other kind of inflation that he'd seen in asset prices. He could have just as easily hung mementos on the wall, such as the bank charters for Penn Square and Continental Bank, to remind him what happens when rising asset prices exert their own logic on borrowers and lenders, and what happens when fragile bubbles bring the entire financial system to a halt. However, Tom never forgot what his neighbor told him when he imparted the gift. I want you to have it to remind you what can happen if you do your job poorly. So I thought that was a, a great note. So that is chapter three and an end. So now we kind of leave off here with uh, Paul Volcker's out. We got the end of the 80s where, where you know, we just had this the kind of Black Monday, the stock market crash in 1987. And now Greenspan is in and it's 1991. And, the, and Tom just got the top job. He's now president of the Kansas City Fed. And we're going to see what happens now after 1981. You know, Greens, the legendary Alan Greenspan is in there. And we'll see what uh, how how things proceed as we kind of go through the 90s. So. Um, so with that, I'm going to get out of here. So I hope that I know these episodes are a little longer, but I, I hope that everybody's really enjoying this. I hope that they're enjoying this this series. I, I feel like there's just so much great information. I mean, this work really this book really is a masterpiece on a history of the Fed and more in particular, what has happened over the last 50 years and then ultimately what has really transpired over the last 15 years. And, and you'll see as we get into the second and third parts of the book, we're really going to focus on what went down the last 15 years in particular. So I hope everybody is really enjoying this uh, series. And if you, if you are, please make sure to, to like, subscribe, share. That really helps the channel. Please leave your comments below. I'd be happy to answer any questions as we continue to go through this, as we continue to take this journey together. And uh, like I said, I hope everybody will come back real soon and continue checking these episodes out. And I will be back next week with uh, chapter four. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>